It's another Spike Studio production. Welcome to the e-discovery primer for Domino Administrators with Bill Michelski. This one is sponsored by SecureTrack. SecureTrack is your solution for all of your discovery needs inside of your Lotus Domino environment. This one runs just over an hour long. You'll hear from SecureTrack at the beginning and Bill for the rest of the session. If you have any questions, please feel free to forward them in. We'll get them over to either SecureTrack or Bill at another consultant in your pocket webcast. Back and relaxing and learning with you, actually, as we go through. A couple key things. Uh, we have some more on the schedule coming up shortly. Uh, I've had a few people request direct information of sessions they want to see. So if you have particular sessions you want to see, Please let me know, send them in. I'd be glad to get them on the schedule as best we can. Uh, also, we announced the sponsorship of IBM for IM Lug, so you're going to see a lot of news coming about that. Our presenter today, Bill, will be there uh, presenting sessions, as well as our sponsor company today will be there in presence. So we've had a good collection of everybody going on. If you have anything else you need from me, please send me a direct email and all these replays have been online, so you're able to watch them at your leisure later on or refer them to other people in your office or you know, other people in your local user group community. <coughs> so with that, I'm going to send it over to Ryan and let those guys tell you a little bit about SecureTrack and Extracom and everything else. Ryan, one second, and you will have control, sir. Excellent, Chris, and thank you for that. Uh, once you pass control across, it is you Ryan Hossford with Extracom here today. To I'm also joined with Stephen Alexander, and what we'll be doing is taking a quick walk through SecureTrack, and uh, from that regard, uh, our imagery of the iceberg and what we find when we get out of the gates with these type of compliance-oriented sessions is there's a lot of hesitation, concern, and it's nothing more than uh, a steamship heading towards an iceberg without being properly prepared, and that's why we love this imagery. And uh, our group of admins that are involved in many of these calls trying to explain to upper management, security groups, whoever else is involved, uh, again reflecting to that imagery of the balance of the iceberg, the other nine-tenths that sits below the water of what you're trying to achieve, and let them know that, uh, for the most part, ignorance uh, is no longer acceptable. So moving forward, what we like to do is say it's a mindset, because as many of you are aware, it's, uh, we're no longer dealing with that external threat that everybody dumped all their umpteen uh, budget dollars in over the past decades uh, trying to protect themselves from what's going on outside coming in. But now we're looking at the inside view. So, uh, and I think, and uh, Stephen would agree with me, that the admin groups are the best people to start looking for tools to actually address that. You're very inquisitive. You already have a large amount of uh, responsibility riding on your shoulders, but you understand your environment like no other. SAP cutbacks uh, allows maybe for a good opportunity for a product, maybe like SecureTrack, to step in, lend a helping hand. It's actually a win-win because uh, as the product has evolved over the years, uh, we do address compliance nature functions, but uh, a lot of the admins provide a feedback of how the product's gone up and beyond and help them in other parts of their responsibilities, their daily lives. So. Just keep jumping forward, and I maybe should slow down a touch just to let you know at any time. If you do have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand, interject, and uh, ask me to touch a little further on something, or if it's a technical nature, Stephen Alexander is more than happy to uh, step in on that. But refocusing, secure track, what we're looking at today, what we're doing is basically addressing anything that travels through the domino environment. Uh, we kind of uh, joke around here being the pioneers of the, the who, what, when, and where because uh, back before a lot of these compliance standards came in, we were already offering a lot of the accountability, traceability that uh, people are looking for. And uh, really, uh, whether it's a large organization, small organization, everybody really has to cover themselves these days and uh, when you're looking at your organization and what type of information needs to be generated, uh, the true answer for the most part is all of it because uh, when it comes down to it, we could be looking at different aspects of uh, the information collected which will lead more so to Bill's portion of the presentation today. But the angles we cover, whether it comes to legal investigation or lit litigation, uh, you do see many of the monitors which SecureTrack will cover off for you, whether it's open, illegal, open, updates and deletes. You really have to be able to give that starting point and finishing point of, amongst everything in between to those auditors when they come knocking at that door to actually look into information. A couple of the attributes up there uh, obviously are pretty uh, 
uh, excuse me, are obvious, I apologize, but uh, some of the other ones, bulk action detection is very popular for admins up and beyond the compliance measures if people are going in and deleting their mail files. Uh, what if uh, someone is leaving the organization and copying a, a database on their way out? But also, we'll also look at a quick uh, screenshot that also uh, highlights some of the savings that you could also look at at restoring deleted and updated documents at the click of a button. Uh, I think the essence around here is really that uh, we get approached by a lot of companies that uh, find that they are going to take it on in-house, uh, whether it's before the fact or after the fact. They thought they're going to bring it in-house and have an employee create such standards and uh, abilities to track such information or report on it. But what they found is maybe it's not granular enough, it's not complete enough. Uh, how are they keeping up with upgrades? And again, uh, how, how transferable is it to other applications that they have running in-house when someone comes and says, hey, that application is audited and that looks really nice. Can you apply it to this one? And the, the person just throws their hands up and says, well, it was custom for this one. But uh, I think the essence of it all is you truly have enough on your plate and that's where SecureTrack can really step in and uh, lend that helping hand, as mentioned. Uh, moving forward, uh, no one really does want to look at a product that uh, comes in that has to have a lot of consulting. Uh, what we are is the next best thing to uh, actually having uh, yourselves build it in-house. With that being said, instant deployment. Uh, if anybody, uh, your group here, the notes admins, are very intuitive, the product is intuitive along those same lines, and you can basically follow it to getting it set up as easily as in 30 minutes. And from that, there's no program, and it's not intrusive on your environment. Uh, outside of compliance measures, although that's the driving force today, uh, you could also use the product as a deterrent, uh, reinforcing and motivating proper behaviors, uh, uh, following policies and procedures for etiquette within emails and so forth. Uh, but again, you have that real time notifications of any of these occurrences happening, whether it's in a database, email, or such. Uh, and allows you to be a li little bit more proactive. If a database uh, is deleted, you can resurrect that before any man hours are lost. Uh, again, adding value, making your daily workload a little easier. From, from some secure track, uh, the, when we were first uh, built back in the day to uh, uh, accomplish many things, it was actually within the financial industry that secure track was created. Since then, it's matured into a product that addresses many of the actual uh, compliance measures you do and not limited to, to the ones that you see on the screen there. Uh, and what we're doing is we're logging the evidence of any user tampering within your environment. Uh, but the essence of the product are those before and after values. If you can't see where it was and where it's moved to, uh, it would offer very little value. Uh, I'm sure that Bill will also touch on some of the actual uh, specifics of different uh, measures, uh, but we do have the ability to retain certain documents or all documents as uh, allocated or recognized by yourself for periods of time and kept uh, amongst our housekeeping or archiving and then cut off accordingly to your warehousing cell. Just to take a quick snapshot, a glance at what we are capturing uh, with each log file and uh, just noting that this is all within Lotus Notes 100% native, so it's all searchable. But in this instance, what you would see in the top left corner is an initiator. You can see the form, the document ID, which is a live link back to the actual document. You can see the action in the right highlighted in red for what the actual occurrence is indicating. A global timestamp for the larger organizations. And of course, the IP address, which is critical these days, uh, whether someone uh, has uh, mimicked an actual, uh, excuse me, stolen an actual ID file and is doing something malicious from a different workstation or wherever, they can actually track that down and hone in on it. But what you do see at the bottom there, highlighted in yellow are the actual changes. Green is indicating fields that have not changed. You have the original value and the new value. This is for the field level, but it does extend out to rich text as well as attachments. One other aspect is that uh, we do capture all this information and uh, you're looking down the road, you've created these actual uh, monitors to look for specific information that you do know that's going to happen. But a lot of people ask us about prevention and this is where our policy and e-discovery steps in. Uh, and with that, using standard regular expression in our wizards, similar to the mail file rule, uh, what this allows for is to stop actual uh, emails from leaving your environment 
Um, a lot of our customers have, uh, well, maybe yourself as well, obviously dealing with credit card numbers and using formulas or the regular expression in these facts prevent any customer or actually corporate credit card numbers from leaving the environment as a good example. Furthermore to that, another attribute for the e-discovery is the excuse me, secure search. And this does allow for searching log files, whether live or the actual secure track log files. You can save these search criteria to revisit them if they're on the monthly events. And again, when you're looking at for a product that's all in one, I believe SecureTrack can address all your needs up and beyond building it in-house. Uh, just in wrap up, uh, from my side before I hand the reins across to Bill there, uh, just a reminder uh, from uh, all the attendees for today's presentation, today's event, <coughs> are uh, allocating out or uh, making available test drives, 2010 test drives with SecureTrack. Uh, if uh, in closing uh, we can share our contact information, of course, contact us and we'll be supplying a key for the product itself. What we'll do here is pass the reins across to Bill, and uh, without further ado, an e-discovery primer for admins, and we do appreciate you taking the time and taking a look at SecureTrack today. And if anybody has any uh, questions, feel free to raise your hands as we go along. Uh, because of the uh, nice audience size, we're able to actually take questions as we go. And Bill, I'm going to pass it over to you. Okay, so... And here it comes. Great. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, I think we're, we're good. Can everybody see? And there it comes, and there you are. Awesome. You're off. Okay. I am all off. Excellent. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of the day and trying into the East, the, excuse me, the e-discovery primer for Lotus Domino admins. And even if you're a developer, we still got uh, a couple things out there uh, sprinkled in that will be of value. So we want to make sure that everybody gets something out of the presentation. So I'm going to also see if I can just slide this console off to the, to the, let me slide it over here, that way I can see better. There we go. Okay. So, there we go. And so what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to go through a subject that's uh, near and dear to my heart. I've been working with regulated firms for over 20 years and started my career out in Wall Street. So. So from there, I, I've worked on many different types of compliance projects. So we're going to cover basically some planning, saving costs, and saving your butt. Those are the three things that we're really going to do. So if any one of those are of interest to you, then this is a good place to be. So we'll, we'll go through basically setting up some planning, the inner facets of journaling compliance, then we'll get into options of, of the technical planning, and, and the impacts they're in, some time-saving technical tips and measures, and then we're going to get into some, to some advanced measures. So this is based on a wiki article that I did as well, and if you've seen me speak on this previously, uh, there'll be a little bit of overlap, but we've got some new features sprinkled throughout and a lot of new content in the end. So buckle up, because here we go. All right. So just for those who don't know me, uh, I am Bill Mal, your Lotus pal, and I've been working with Node since 93. I do a lot of architect, admin, training, and so forth. I've written a couple of red books on Linux, and I, I do a lot of speaking as well, and we touched on the last point. So now just as a disclaimer, because this is compliance and their impacts to your company, is basically you're giving a lot of stuff. If your, entire, if your entire environment implodes, breaks down, don't call us. No one with the group is responsible. And also, let's see, I think uh, that's it. And we're all set. Also, um, with the uh, Consultant in Your Pocket series, just a, a couple quick, very simple announcements. Uh, we have no problem with you setting your cell phones too loud. It doesn't bother us a bit. And if you need the restroom, remember that is down your hallway. All right. So some poor jokes to start off the session. Let's go. Five easy steps to get to a great plan. So basically, when you get in, if you, if you take all the possible facets of what you can uh, do in a compliance project, I want to distill this down into to a couple simple, simple things to consider. So first is what's your horizon, and whether you're going to have a lawsuit imminent or if you're doing a best practices project or implementation, that's going to stipulate how much you can do and when you can do it. So it's important to understand that going in. 
Um, you want to meet with legal. I don't know of any tech that likes to sit in a room full of lawyers. I have not yet met that person, but it is something you need to do, particularly for these types of projects. Um, so the third is, and I'll get into the reasons why in a little bit, um, determining your technical needs. You're going to do journaling, you're going to do archiving. What specifically are we going to need to, to do this? And you get some of these requirements for meeting with legal as well, so they can be helpful. Um, now, you're going to need to identify the key project team members, and of course, you want to have a proper execution strategy, because if you have all this, this great information, but you don't execute correctly, then, then this project will be unsuccessful. So now let's dive into these a little bit. So understanding the timeline, and everyone in the team understanding the timeline, will ensure success. So I've been in projects where I've shown up, and they've asked me to do a lawsuit, excuse me, help them with a lawsuit, they actually had several pending, and they were responding to a state a attorney general request to, to, to provide information. So clearly in that situation, you're not going to have time to do best practices and go through everything. So we would consider that to be a phase two initiative. Whereas if you are, um, you, if you don't have that scenario, then of course you can really plan from the beginning how to do things correctly. So again, really important to understand that. And if you have a lawsuit, Everybody in the team needs to know when you need to respond. So um, the, you want to also ensure that if you're in a lawsuit and there are people of interest for the courts, you do not purge any data for those individuals. And I know of several cases where techs were doing their job, that occurred, and the company had to pay millions because the court thought that they were destroying sensitive information during an investigation so they thought they were destroying evidence. So you want to make sure that you, you avoid that as well. Now, uh, in preventive maintenance mode, again, if you have a longer timeline and looking at your, your best practices, data purging is fine within regulations. So knowing what your regulations are and that will be outlined generally by your legal team, sometimes security will get involved as well, and, but then you can you know, maintain your data going forward based on that. So with a successful team, what you're going to do is really, it, it can be determined based on the size of your company. So some of the roles here that I see, like compliance officer, security officer, they may be the same person in a smaller office, but if you are a larger company, then you'll generally have more people at the table. So domino admin, of course, your legal team representative, generally you'll have one person who's the go-between from IT over to legal, and then you'll have your, your standard legal meetings backup, team contact if that's not the admin, and then your standard network and infrastructure team members. All very important to have those, those individual facets represented on the project. So looking at the technology side, you've got the backup, retention, restoration, your usual suspects, data management process. It's important to know what, what type of data you're going to have and how you need to, to manage and store that. But then also uh, testing each component and doing this at predefined intervals. And we'll get into that a little bit later on as well in some more detail. But basically having a reasonable frequency is important to ensure that what you store and what you capture can be retrieved at any given moment. You're going to audit this as well to make sure that your parts are working consistently going forward. And any and all requirements provided to your solution must include. And it may sometimes be multiple vendors. You may have to outsource the backup. You may have to work with different offices in your company that may have an outsourced data center, whereas you may be holding your own data center. So it's just important to make sure that that's all taken into account. Okay, so frequent training is the key here, without question. I've seen several firms where they go in, they'll do management one time. They'll, excuse me, they'll tell management one time, hey, we've, we've trained everybody. They know the process. Senior manager checks it off. They smile. Everybody feels good. They pat themselves on the back. Then stuff happens. People change. People go on vacation. Maybe there's maternity leave or extended leave of absence for whatever reason. Um, new resources come in. People move within the parts of the firm, and they never get the training. And that's a big problem because one errant task can cost millions. I know of a story where they had an individual who received some equipment from somebody who retrieved. Unfortunately, that person did not know they were in scope for a a, uh, is a person of interest for a pending lawsuit that was with the firm. 
and they recycled the hardware, which is their normal operating procedure. The trainee did not come down to that person because he was new, and the, the, the firm got caught in an audit, and they had to respond to the court for that. So it's very important that you train constantly on this. And the CIOs and CTOs need to embrace the KISS method for this. If you make compliance measures on the implementation side very difficult for the end users to follow, they're just not going to do it. And that leaves an exposure for you, and then you have to do an additional risk assessment. So it's also extremely important that, particularly when email, sometimes you'll see uh, you can click on uh, a, a button in your, your mail client uh, template where I see people will customize it, and you can just preface the subject with confidence, where they'll put in uh, top secret or, or confidential or whatever the appropriate term is for the company. And those are great and easy to do, but if they actually have to remember to do it in, in terms of typing it manually and so forth, sometimes it doesn't happen. Or if it's four or five steps or they have to go through several menus, it's just not going to happen. So it's important to make sure that you test and understand that uh, you have to work with your users. Okay, trust but verify. Just because you're good friends with other departments doesn't mean they're going to back you up. So, and in cases where you need to verify backups, um, it's important to, to understand um, that some places people want to be nice to each other, and if they do something wrong, they just don't want to tell you. They feel bad, and generally because people are good, but it happens. So you have to make sure that you verify, so forth. For example, I was at a uh, legal response project, and they were performing daily server backups, but there were no restores. And we were curious about this. And they didn't do restores until I, I arrived. Basically, the service level from management down to IT was to back up the servers daily. So IT backed them up. But there was no service level for restores. So what happened? The first day I arrived, a semi full with 200,000 backup tapes arrived. No labels on none. Scout's honor. That was an amazing first day to the project. They never put labels on the tapes because there was no service level for restore, so they never had to restore anything. You always want to make sure that you go through every facet of the project. Speaking of facets, let's get into journaling and compliance. So compliance can force the data manager policy based on the types of data you're going to be managing, how long you're going to handle it, and so forth, whether you're uh, dealing with corporate litigation, intensified scrutiny of financials, uh, if there's a corporate scandal that's going on. I worked at a financial house. Uh, this is public, but I, I will, out of courtesy for them, I won't use their name. And one of their senior managers had a laptop with customer information, and she decided there was a hassle to take it into the restaurant when she went for dinner, so she left it in the laptop bag in on the floor of the back seat behind the driver's seat of her vehicle. Came out after dinner, laptop was gone. That went public. Stock dropped 25% uh, overnight, and there was a big scandal. She unfortunately was terminated. It was a terrible thing. But you know, handling that type of data and what you do in those scenarios can drive your compliance. Courts refuse to accept noncompliance excuses. Long gone are the days before the Microsoft trial when you could come in to a court and say, it's going to take us too long to complete that disclosure motion. It's going to be too expensive for us. We don't have all the required data. You can't do that anymore. Courts will nail you, and they have very short fuses for that. Courts are also technologically advanced. They're not as advanced as private, but in terms of their ability to data mine, it's quite amazing what they can do, and they take it very, very seriously. So it's something to consider. So basically, motivation is where you find it. Failure to provide full information, disclosure, may introduce significant fines or imprisonment, and local laws and, inf and infraction severity can vary. So what would be a severe penalty or imprisonment in one locale may just be a, a, a significant fine in another, but it's important to know this. And that this tends to be quite a motivating factor for many companies. OK. Uh, waiting for my page to come up here. There we go. Okay, so should you be concerned? Well, basically, I was involved at a company when the Marsh McLennan case happened up in New York State for overbilling a customer. And you'll find that even if the company that's being investigated by a court is not regulated, 
the first four usual suspects that always get pulled in are going to be financial, legal, accounting, and insurance. There are regulated companies, the professional firms, and they have key information about the, their client. So courts are always going to ask them, so if you work in any of these verticals, expect, if you haven't already, to be included in the future. Now the rest, again, any company can be investigated. So just because, just because the, you're unregulated, doesn't matter. The courts tend to file the money. So even if you're a client of a client is investigated, it goes to financial or to a financial firm. Then they send something over to their accounting firm, and then they have a problem. And there was a car service firm that carried a briefcase for a person. That car service firm can be brought in to testify. So you want to make sure that if you deal with any type of regulated firm, regardless of your stature from the SEC that you handle all your data properly. Okay, stuff to protect yourself. So the best defense is a good offense. I dislike cliches, but in this scenario it is good it is quite fitting. If you look at just mail, you're leaving yourself open and that's a risk because clients nowadays you have text messages, there's calendar events. Remember that that Reminder notices, which can contain sensitive information, do not propagate out on the network. They stay within the mail file. Instant messaging data as well. So that can be on your phone or on a desktop piece. People can do those now. And you also have mobile equipment. All of these need to be considered in your data management policy and your e-discovery and data management projects. So you can protect yourself from these with message journaling doing backups, and then there's full, and, and including a, excuse me, creating a full and complete data management strategy to make sure that all of these risk opportunities or risk areas are included. Okay, so two of the most common recent regulations, I'm sure many people have heard of HIPAA, Public Law 104-191 came into being in 1996. Basically, it was designed to help protect patients against fraud and abuse, and ensuring that in the age of electronic records that your files were protected. I mean, I think we've all seen the thrillers or dramas where you just have the casual nurse or medical assistant come by, a couple keystrokes, and the entire record is gone. Okay, well, you know, that's nice in the movies. It doesn't work quite that easily in real life, but HIPAA helps to ensure that that doesn't happen. Okay, the other one is Sarbanes-Oxley. This came out in 2002, Public Law 107-204. Basically helps to protect against disaster recovery, data protection, storage management for all financial, corporate financial records and ensure financial responsibility within those departments. It's created a lot of work for IT, and I'm sure that's, a, that's a, no surprise to anybody here. Okay, but just remember that Outside of those two, each industry does present its own set of unique requirements. Financial firms also track books and records. I believe that's SEC 17-4A. So outside of SOX, there's a whole other set of regulations on, on what to track. And lawyers are very hot on that. Uh, food preparation firms have safe handling. Chemical firms have toxic waste management, environmental regulations. Manufacturing firms, their machinery is almost always in scope. Each regulation must be handled and audit-proof internally, thus the, the, the creation of the internal auditor. And they go through all the different departments of your firm to make sure everything is there. And then they report to the ultimate auditing agency, which may be a big six or big four firm or uh, anyone else that you might have handling that. They will work with your legal department. And just because that division or that firm is non-technical, the regulations can be technical because where are they storing all that data? So a chemical firm that has environmental regulations is going to be storing it in most cases on a server somewhere or a data store or a SAN, and that information then falls into the IT area for compliance. Okay, so knowing your federal regulations, data store durations. This is very important, and this is one of the most common miscues at companies is they know that they're in scope for SOX or HIPAA, but they don't store the data long enough. They think a few years is there. Five-year minimum for all accounting and audit records for SOX. Six-year minimum for all health records without exception. If you're not doing that now, introduce a conversation with your legal team because you want to make sure 
that you don't get caught later, later down the road. Change management is critical here because you want to ensure that your firm handles any, any change volatility correctly. Inter-team inter communication is, is absolutely essential. You need to ensure that cross teams within your company on the project, everybody is communicating to ensure that your, your, your data, your changes are all handled properly. And you want to at least communicate with your legal team liaison quarterly. New court's decisions are made all the time. That, those decisions then affect law. Then they get presented at the Bar Association. The attorneys go to the Bar Association. They go to their meetings. They get this new information. And then it comes down to them. Your meeting with them will ensure that you get the latest changes. You want to make sure that you are not blindsided later on. In doing this and acting upon any modifications they provide, and implementing them before a crisis introduces itself is one simple way to ensure that you can dramatically reduce the number of over hours or excessively long weeks. Corporate safety net, journaling, messaging. So archiving does not equate to what journaling is. So then what is journaling? Journaling captures, in a nutshell, email transmissions. It's the storage via digital safe. And it's located apart from the in-scope and user's mail file. So the store is separate and, and can be on the same server, but does not necessarily need to be where the mail is located. It's generally unavailable or should be unavailable to the end users. It does scale for group servers or entire company, depending on your needs. And unless in some form, the users never know of ex its existence. And I have a best practice we can discuss later on in the deck. So multiple location preferences. You can throw it on the Domino server, remote storage area, such as appliance. And those are generally the two most common areas that we'll find. But I thought that was archiving. Well, archiving actually takes messages from your primary database and offloads them to a separate data storage, generally on a slower file system. And this allows you to keep costs down, because you only have to, not only do you have to have your expensive or fast disk running this, but you can back up the archive a couple times a month. And if you manage when messages are put into the archive, you can back up 80% of your mail a couple times a month, and you back up to 20%, which is the most recently used mail, nightly. And now you've had a significant decrease in the amount of data you're backing up, and that will propagate to the amount of storage you need for your backups, the amount of tapes you have to store, and the tapes you have to manage long term. So there's huge, huge implications there. The difference, the big difference here from the end user, end user standpoint is they take an access to the archive, and they should be able to. That's where the mail that they don't use all the time is located. It does a lot for deletions, particularly if you're using journaling because you've captured it already. And it's a nice cost-cutting play, to, to some of which I alluded to earlier. OK, so data mining tools. Now, they're very helpful, but they don't provide a lot in terms of compliance risk reduction. They utilize the mail file for the target database. And you, can, and you generally are searching mail after the fact. So it is excellent for extracting very finite or subtle aspects of a mail file to satisfy a requirement, much easier than doing it manually. But the, the uh, end user you know, can edit or purge messages before the capture is ever initiated. So this makes it compliance adverse. So basically, it's really best served for managing your archive rather than a compliance-oriented task. So you have mail archiving related tools, controlling end user mail files, and then journaling tools, recording and reporting messaging transactions. So knowing the difference of when to use them will also ensure a successful project. So routed mail takes many forms. You have Lotus Notes iNotes, Domino applications, external, internal, SMTP servers, and mobile mail conduits. Not, not always do people consider each of these when looking to capture their mail. So real-time management programs coupled tightly with proper journaling tools will ensure success here. Because now you'll be able to ensure that your message types, all message types flowing into, out of, or within Domino are captured. And then immediately, the digital vault stores the messages. So that way you remove the potential for anyone deleting a message and then having nefarious activities go undetected. So capture and extraction. 
journaling has two sides. So first is you've got to capture the information. And it's made better with Lotus, because now Lotus does provide a decent native journaling tool. It's included with the Core Server product, for those unfamiliar with it, and provides a real-time management program. It gives you an automatic naming rollover. So based on your criteria, it will automatically create a new journal with new naming, and it will generally enumerate it as, as your needs arise. And it will then also get into predefined naming conventions. So you can set up the parameters, and it will adhere to that allows for much better storage management because you can offload the older, journal, older journals, put them to a new, new storage area, and back them up as appropriate, and again, keeping your backup costs down. If you have it on a, a different file system, you don't need to back it up nightly because you know things aren't changing on it. But the extraction tool in the Lotus space is not as robust as it could be. So when searching for better extraction tools, you want to look at journals um, and Really, if they're returning the matching messages that meet your needs, you want to select the appropriate messages from the return set, but also that the package results into a court acceptable format. So those are some key facets on the extraction side. So know your tool requirements before implementation. Some utilize the domino journaling task and avoid recreating a, a journaling capability, so avoiding reinventing the wheel. But it can be offset with a more elegant search tool. And others prefer prefer to replace the domino capability altogether. And you'll see that more so with appliance setups than the journaling piece. So on the real-time message side, the, the, the key advantage here is that you can stop content delivery capabilities. So if somebody puts in, say, a social security number or an account number, you can search with wildcards and, and, and strings. You can stop that message from ever leaving your organization. Now you can keep, and, but you can instead of killing the delivery altogether, you can just force it to stay internally, which may be fine because typically people within an organization will route account numbers back and forth as they manage accounts. So, so you may want that option. But, but through advanced message body filtering. Again, we discussed the, the pattern matching, but regardless of the message's source, if it hits a domino box, the real-time engine is going to capture it. It will measure it against your criteria, and then it will handle the appropriate action as you, you've set up. And failures are handled, again, by an action. So if something does not work or does not pass all the filters, it will be captured, and then it will respond to your needs. Okay, so now let's look at the uh, excuse me options of planning impact. You really do need a plan to start the project. So many, so many teams just take the, the old Nike marketing line of just do it to the extreme, where they just sit down, OK, we've got to get this done. We've got six months, and they just go in, and they, they bulldoze the whole thing, and then they lay down the, the asphalt, and they think they're done. They never take into account the geotechnical engineering samples, maybe the soil, where the conditions are, how much dampening need to be, do you need in-ground supports. And then how do you handle how many layers of gravel and so forth before you actually get to the, the asphalt. So in terms of IT, yeah, it's nice that we need to it's nice that we need to have compliance, but what are our requirements? Which regulations do we need to adhere? Um, how long do we have the backups? How much data do we back up? Are our backups completing? You need to go through all these things and understand what you need to accomplish. Every hour that you plan on, on serious planning on the project will save you weeks on the back end. And it is quite remarkable, the, the difference. And it's counterintuitive for a lot of techs because we just like to go in, and we're used to, particularly in the administration side, a lot of our work is very objective. You come in, there's a server down, you have to get it up as quickly as possible. There's no project plan for that. So actually changing your mental approach to thinking of coming up with a plan can be very difficult for a lot of people in the technical field. But for this type of project, it's absolutely paramount, absolutely critical to, to a successful outcome. And back to the, the, the initial point on legal, you must have input from legal on this without question. If you don't, you're, you will be destined for failure, and you're going to have a lot of in-company fighting between teams. And then senior management is going to get involved a lot more than they need to, and it's going to get ugly real fast. But as a smart tech, 
what you can do to protect yourself is we know from anybody who sat down with attorneys, they change their minds a lot. It's not that they're doing anything wrong, but legal requirements can change, as we talked about the, the cases in the Bar Association meetings. So sometimes there's a good reason for it. They're not just being difficult. So what you can do is, and I, and I train my clients on this, is that make sure that when you're in the meetings, you document all decisions agreed upon. Then version your notes for after each change. So if you have a spreadsheet or you're writing this in a, in a, in a domino or notes journal, make sure that you version your notes after each change or each item as it changes so that you can refer to it later on. This ensures that you're protected and covered both internally and in the court proceeding. Because I have seen cases where IT managers can get subpoenaed and have had to go testify, and they will then seek input from their senior administrators. And that, that information that the administrators provide goes to court and is in the public record. So you want to make sure that you are able to provide information that not only protects yourself, but makes your team and your company look good. This is one way to ensure that that occurs. Now, if you don't do any of this, Project deliverables are really as good as the time you commit up front to thorough planning. So again, if you lack a good discovery process model, you're going to burn cash very quickly. And rather than having this be relatively reasonably priced, I've seen firms for every court response they have, it can cost them tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars per request. And if they have several disclosure motions or they're involved in a suit with one state attorney general and then that company does business in another state, so another state attorney general is there. When I was working over at an insurance firm for the Marsh McLennan case, we started off with one for New York State, and then by the time we finished their requirements, six other states joined in on the lawsuit, and then we had to reply with similar requests for each of those states. And many times it was the same information provided, but we had to provide a new case, a new full data set, and pull the same information again. So if you don't have a good process, this gets very expensive very quickly. And ad hoc execution drives up the cost because if you don't have a plan and you're not expecting this, then you have to take time away from all the other work that you're doing. And nobody likes to do that. Then you're there working late, you miss time with the family, you, lo you lose weekends, and it just it goes downhill from there very quickly. But with a good plan, it can be operational. If you set this up, properly, it can be just as simple as responding to any other trouble ticket. It comes through the system, you know what you need to do, you kick off the process, you get the information, and you can rely on that because you know what you have works, you've done the testing, you've done the restores, and everything you have is going to be reliable and effective. So that's a much simpler process than trying to be in constant firefighting mode. Okay, so now we talked about journals, but should we use multiple journals, and when would you want to do those? Well, the cases. I've seen it where it's a good idea is when you have really complex legal requirements or if you're involved in multiple court order disclosure responses simultaneously or when the responses have unique timelines or persons to monitor apart from the primary journal, which generally is company-wide but not always. So now you want to ensure that your search and capture tools allow for multiple journals as well. So it's going to simplify the overall process if you plan for this requirement ahead of time. So now let's look at, we did the theoretical in the previous slide, so let's look at the actual usage side. Excuse me. The usual path is that, let's say that you have a journal running for a team or a division of your company, and then you get a request in that, well, user 11 is a person of interest. And so the court decides that they want a 30-day analysis of their mail. Well, if they weren't in scope initially, that can increase, increase the response time for larger firms because you have to then add them in and you have to filter through all the mail, the existing mail, in the larger journal. What you can do instead is just create a journal just for that person, starting it with a 30-day window, making a label useful, and, and then what happens is now, when you're done, you just take that journal and give it to the court. Nice, clean, and simple, and you're done. You don't have to go through and get other teams involved and... Uh, needlessly, and you can respond much faster. Legal's happy, the court's happy, your boss is happy, and you can get back to work and save yourself a lot of time. So it's a win-win all around. Now, planning ahead can also provide significant cost savings. So if there's even a small chance 
performing specialty captures or subset groupings, you're going to want to make sure that you plan for that now, not when it happens, because it can be much harder, particularly if you have the wrong product that doesn't allow for that capability. So always ensure that whatever tool you select is going to allow to grow and meet and scale your future needs. Okay, so let's now look at the three types of journaling models. Okay, basically, we mentioned the appliance briefly earlier, and that's a standalone network add-on that stores messages in the, dig in the digital safe. Domino, as a journaling model, has tools and capabilities included with your license, and then there's third-party on-server journaling models. So let's look at these briefly. So you've got, on the appliance side, again, it's a standalone unit. You just plug it into your network somewhere, give it an IP address, and it's generally designed for larger enterprises or verticals that incur significant paper needs. So it does not alter your domino configuration per se, but it's important to know that each domino box is going to require a hook. It's not on the server, so the only way it can capture its mail is if there's a slight configuration change in the mail.box. Now you're going to need, in many cases, you're going to need corporate approval for this type of enhancement. So you're going to want to make sure that that is known ahead of time and you get buy-in before you sign any contracts. Now on the design side, understand that this architecture will significantly increase your traffic. So because the appliance takes a copy of each message routed and routes it to the appliance. So if you have 100 servers a day on a saturated LAN, imagine the help desk calls you're going to get. So you've just doubled your mail traffic. So you want to make sure that you plan for this. Again, thinking ahead of time to ensure problems reduces the number of health desk calls and makes for an easier implementation. If you don't account for this, you're going to have issues down the line, and sometimes immediately. Now on the Lotus side, they provide a native journaling feature, which is easy to set up, doesn't take very much effort, and this has been talked about as, as a product at many lugs, and um, so and it's been around and it's quite, it's, it's quite stable and works quite well. Now the implement the inst on the installation side, you have a mail-in database. So the Lotus gives you two options. You can do a mail-in database, which is a sends a copy from the receiving server over to the target server, and basically becomes a simplified appliance. So it will increase your mail traffic, or you can have a local journal on each server. So there's no increase in traffic, and it just routes messages to a local journal file on the same server. Now you will need to know that you're going to have to back up. Um, a normal bat domino backup will include the journal file, but you want to make sure that that's in there just in case you put it into a non-standard directory. But special care is going to be required, particularly if you have a mail and database for multiple journals. So again, just making sure that you know what you have and that you capture the data wherever it lies. The strength of your interaction tool is extremely important in determining how effective your retrieval process is. Because enabling rollover for your journals does not equate a multiple journal setup. And I want to make sure we're clear on that. All you're doing with rollover is just basic load balancing. So, so, it's, so it's different than having two files capturing mail from different sources. But then also if you have multiple journals, you should be able to, to search them. So knowing again what your requirements are and being able to handle that is important. So the third party option now of doing an on-journal servering option, generally you'll see where they will use the Domino journaling service. So it provides a better front end to the existing Domino provided back end. Gives you better filtering and retrieval options, which can be very important. But there are a few that will use their own journaling task. And that gives them the real-time management capability and then they'll use their own database structure. The tool will install easily without disturbing the existing domino, domino infrastructure, but it's very important that you remove the domino journaling task from your, your server tasks line. You want to turn off the domino native task and configure the settings and filters accordingly. If you don't do that, you can have some race conditions and your, the results will be different than you would expect. So several independent on-server journaling models utilize real-time management techniques, which are good. And we talked a little bit about those earlier. Now, providing increased filtering is also uh, important 
and you get this by inspecting the message before the mailbox mail.box receives the message. So that's what the third party tool can also provide is that before it gets the, the message because they have the hook in there, they'll grab it before it actually gets delivered. So there's an additional design considerations. Every vendor, every vendor does this a little differently. So it's just important to know how they do it and whether or not that's going to mesh with your culture. Now if you have a good journal, a good if, excuse me, if you have a good retrieval tool, you also have a good journal. Simply because third party tools shine here because you can take the, the good underlying tool that created your journal and use some really stellar parts, products on top of it. So you have the ability to acquire data regardless of the search criteria. That's important. You have the, the, the draft more complex searches than you might be able to do otherwise. And so what you can do to test a product of interest is that draft what you feel some of your worst case scenarios are, some of your more complex searches. And then as you're evaluating products, see if they stand up. If they do, then you have a winner. If they don't, then you really want to look at something else because although it may meet your needs up front, down the line it's, it's going to have problems. And this is where thinking about cost over function can really come back to hurt you in the long run. Searching across multiple databases is key. Particularly, you want to make sure that if you do journal rollover, if you have multiple journals, that your product will be able to handle that. Otherwise, you're going to have to do manual searches on every single journal file. And if, if it's been a few years, you're going to have a lot of those if you do the rollover. So you want to make sure that you can handle that. The best tools apply for complex extraction. So again, meeting the tough legal requirements or requests by any tool will save you time and make sure that your project is successful and you can meet the needs of the court. OK, so now let's get into the technical stuff. We've done a lot on the theory and planning and given you some tips there, but let's get into some, some good stuff. So these are some journaling worst practices that, that uh, I've seen. First of all, utilizing the journal repository to perform message recalls, end user message restores, and database recovery operations. You should avoid these at all costs. I've seen companies where, well, it takes us 24 hours to do a restore. That's our service level, only backup. But this, Hotshot VP really wants the mail before then. He deleted 2,000 messages. So we're just going to go to the journal because it's faster. That is not the correct use of a journal and actually will cause problems because the mail that you extract doesn't necessarily feed directly back into the mail file in the way the end user is going to expect. So you want to ensure that, that you avoid that. It can be done. I've seen people do it but it's not, it, it creates a lot of problems and causes additional help desk calls. And then you have to deal with internal politics as well. If the VP gets mailed, it doesn't look quite right and they don't know why. Or if the times and dates change. Anyway, I digress. So now another one that is a problem is using the admin ID for the journal access. You never want to have the Domino admin ID use that. Always set up a separate mail journal user. The best practice maximizes security and ensures that whatever you have in there, the data integrity is maintained. So create and register a special user ID for the mail journaling database and assign it multiple passwords. That way, you, no one person can go in there, and if you have a rogue employee, they can't purge things. And you want to avoid that from internal threats as well, which we'll get into later in the presentation. So distribute the passwords so that no one person knows them all, and then ensure this will ensure that consistent multiple parties um, are able to and required to view the contents of the database. So again, no one person can go in there, and if you really have to get something from the journal, everybody knows what's going on, and everybody's on board. Okay, waiting for the next slide. There we go. Now this is another practice to consider avoiding. Avoid alerting all end users to the existence of the journal. So only a select few, in my opinion, should know of its existence, generally the legal and IT departments and corporate management. Otherwise, the calls for restores will come quickly once they know they have that. Oh, you don't have to go to backup. That takes too long. You just get it out of the journal. And then you have to defend all those. And then you have to create extra policy and so forth. Alerting end users of this existence also is situational. But I understand that company culture overrides any one opinion of a, a consultant or even team members. So you have to tread lightly here. 
But here's a good business justification for it. I was at a company and they, um, but where you can have a person su suspected of nefarious activities, if if or even if you're concerned if somebody's doing something based on a rumor and and there's no suspicion of any inappropriate conduct, if the users are unaware of the journal, then you can act accurately prove or disprove without any bias at all because they're not going to do anything differently. Then you can go through the journal and archives and the message logs to determine what actually occurred in terms of mail, who they've been mailing, and the types of content that they have. So that's actually a very nice benefit. So the domino journaling preserves the user ID in the ACL with any journal file rollovers, rollovers, which is a good thing. So if you're going to take the time to create a best practice and safeguard yourself, you want to make sure that you're able to get into all the files. But if you remove the journaling database for whatever reason, during the next restart, Domino will create a new one, which is, which is great, and you would expect that, but inherits the ACL from the journal NTF. So if you have not put in the special journal ID that we discussed a couple slides ago. If you don't put that into the journal NTF, then you could potentially get locked out. So you want to make sure that you manage your ACLs properly. Okay. During backups, particularly when using DAOs and journaling, always, and I mean always, ensure that you capture the attachment repository along with all the archived journals. Failure to do this will ensure that during any type of restore or retrieval operations, you will learn the hard way a new definition of pain. I cannot say it any more succinctly than that. You've been warned. Capture all data. Management always tells us, we need to capture everything. Well, what is everything? They tell you to capture things, and they don't even necessarily know what that really means. Yes, you want to monitor messages that are relevant to compliance, but if you capture every monitoring message, that's going to fill up your journals fast. You're going to have lots of rollovers. Your backup costs are going to go through the roof, and you're going to, roof, and you're going to be capturing information you don't, really, you don't really need. So journaling filters are important here. I spy messages, for one, normally are captured in a journal. You, want, you can create an exception for those rules and, fil and remove them. Other things to consider on DFRs. The original message is in the database. So if they get a, a delivery or failure report and the user resends it, that message is going to be captured too. So you really don't necessarily need the DFR. Quota warning messages might be another one. That company specific, and again, you can determine that. But if you use quotas and you keep them very low and you tend to get a lot of cloning warning, quota warning messages going out, you, you can decide whether or not you want to get those captured, too, and that can save space. Now, Domino third-party journaling solutions. So when us, utilizing a secondary tool, when utilizing a secondary tool for journaling, disable the Domino journaling service. Again, we mentioned that a little earlier, but a few vendors may specifically use the service. You always want to double check, even if it's not apparent when purchasing it. Competing journaling services can cause Daily run issues, worst case, providing an incomplete data set, providing to, to the court. So you want to avoid that as well. And then when using the appliance solution, you want to have team discussions um, around the digital safe and backup. Do you back it up? How often? And so forth. And make sure that whatever you decide, that your solution is going to mend with, with that option. OK. Now, oops, I think we missed this slide here. OK. So there we go. Specific information on, on backup. So review backup reports on a predetermined schedule and regularly and consistent frequency to ensure confidence. So some backup teams know of a missed backup, but they don't tell you right away. And it's imperative that all journal data outside of an appliance is backed up reliably. And I've seen cases where the backup manager and the backup tech knew for weeks that the Domino server wasn't backing up, but they kept telling the backup or the, the admin team the Domino administrators, yeah, well, backups are running nightly. But they knew that the data wasn't being backed up because they didn't have time to deal with it and they didn't want to get any headaches. It's imperative that you know what's going on in your environment and doing restores. Because if you have data that may not be 
you may not be able to restore, you want to, you want to make sure you know about that ahead of time, and then you can manage expectations internally. So know the message retire, knowing your message retention requirements. Mail file and backups may be different. Keys for planning and physical storage needs. A little bit of redundancy, but it's important because I want to make sure that everybody understands this. Every you and you, when including your backup and your retention, your disaster recovery plans must be included. I can't. I've seen at least four or five companies in the last few years that have a DR site and they didn't keep them and include them in any types of backup. So when they failed over to the DR site, even at testing, they weren't backing up the data, and that created an exposure and violated their compliance plans. So some co companies think they're fine until, well, something goes wrong. So I assisted a firm a little while ago where they implemented a backup recycle. They backed up all their tapes and held them for six days, and they just overrode them. This was a complete violation of the SOX, of which they were regulated and, and held accountable to. So we began storing these tapes for five years. Now the discussion was around where we're going to store these tapes for an additional 58 months. Capacity quickly increased from hundreds of thousands of tapes. They needed they had to look at a different offsite storage capacity, how they're going to handle that, whether they want to go with different offsite storage capacity. So the conversations got interesting very quickly because the tapes were coming whether they wanted them to or not, and they needed to put them somewhere. So what they ended up doing is also they thought of, in addition to the tape increases, the, the go-between was to have sand. So they backed up the sand, then they backed up the tape, and that bought them a couple of days. But again, they had to manage this. So let's now look at the numbers. That's the theory. Present state, 25 tapes per night to handle a backup. If you're presuming a minimum nightly growth, multiply that by 60 days, that's 1,500 tapes. So that's what they were managing initially. Once we went to SOX compliance, keeping minimum growth, that if tape inventory quickly escalated to 45,650 tapes. So that's a five-year window. And recall, for planning purposes, with any five-year window, you're going to have at least one leap year, depending on when you start the process. You'll have one or two. Now, some industries require seven years. So with this same example, instead of 45,000, you go to 63,900. That's a lot of tapes. And that's just for 25 tapes a night, which is not necessarily very large. So, so you want to keep all that in mind. But what about the restore option? So you mentioned earlier, you want to make sure that you can do restores. I've seen cases where you have companies where everything was fine. They go down and pull tape, and it fell apart. It broke. They didn't have the humidity control set properly in their off-site place. They didn't know this until they had to do a restore. They couldn't deliver the data requested to the, to the court, and they got in trouble. So you want to make sure you can avoid this scenario by doing regular restores, spot checks, pulling them from different backup sets, doing a restore, making sure that the tapes are good quality and that you can actually get the data and it's usable. If you can't, and I know it's tedious, but this is so important to do all this, but if you can't handle it, you need to record the failed tapes, then do a larger analysis. If you have a failed tape, is it just that one tape? And depending on the type of failure, was it? Bad data put on there? Did the tape itself get broken? Was there water damage that killed an entire box of tapes? So you want to record all that, inform legal, and then come up with a workaround. Then legal can handle that when the case comes in from the court and saying, look, because of the situation we have, we've recorded it. We can't give you this, but we can give you everything else. That is then acceptable or can be for the court and it carries a far lighter penalty, if any at all, than telling them after the fact, oh, by the way, we can't do that. OK, so final tips. You want to reduce your backup requirements by upgrading to 851, 852 is coming out, and switch to ODS 51. Now, if you haven't upgraded to there, then this will be news for you, potentially. But if you are there and you haven't enabled these, you want to make sure that you enable design compression, document compression, and LZ1 attachment compression. Combining all three can save tens of gigs of data per server. So, the, so just a couple quick check boxes can make your life a lot easier. And be certain that, again, you include your disaster recovery site into your journal and compliance requirements. Business continuity, you want to ensure that that occurs during any type of disaster. And here's a positive effect. Last summer, I worked at, at an insurance company. And I was asked to specifically prove that one of their teammates 
they felt was sending company information outside of the firm. And they asked that I research all the mail activities for the suspected breach. For the areas of my concern, the domino environment provided an unequivocal suspicion removal capability and was very happy to be able to state that the person did nothing wrong. So that level of proof is very powerful and ensures that persons of interest avoid any lingering cloud of suspicion which can damage team morale or even their career. So knowing how to use the tools that you have and knowing what Domino provides in terms of capability is not just used to find wrongdoing in your company. It can also remove and, and reinstate in good, good faith a, a trusted colleague. Okay, so now let's look into some advanced compliance measures. So we've looked at the, you know, the, a lot of planning, theoretical stuff, and handling outside threats and responding. But what about internal threats? So this section, what we're really going to do is focus on looking at protecting you from further internal threats, expanding your team, and adding, the, uh, adding value therein, and then what common areas are missed for extracting useful information? OK, so in the last few minutes here, we're going to go through and state that with the need, with internal threats, some firms have the desire to safeguard databases and respective documents. Domino is great with security, as we know, but document level change history may not provide enough information based on requirements. Sensitive databases may have increased pro projection requirements in terms of how long or the types of requirements they need and how those must be handled long term. Internal auditors may mandate field level data and author change history beyond what Domino itself can provide. You'll see this a lot in government agencies, top secret projects, internal traders in the financial firms, merger and acquisition teams, so basically anybody that's behind the wall. So the fix, developers to the rescue. Now, Domino provides an excellent API. And so what we've seen is that Lotus, in addition to the Lotus capability that they provide through the API and the rapid development platform that, that they offer, you can take security to the next level without impeding application workflow usage. So good solutions couple cohesively with Domino's security model, which is nice. And it gives you flexibility in what and how much protection you need. So based on your requirements, the API allows you to really ramp up and come up with some pretty robust solutions to exceed, meet or exceed the increased requirements for legal or your company culture. But in order for this to work, the development team must be on board with your requirements. So they, they need to have a seat at the table. They need to ensure that they can enhance the application's audit features, but they need to know what they are. And if management needs exceed the resource availability or the capability of internal talent, then you you'll, may choose to seek a third party or a readily available ISV option for your needs. So a nod to the coders here. So you thought this was just about administrators from the title. So, But really, once once we've determined the increased audit requirements and we've made the team aware of the new development enhancements that we can provide, put code modules into a scope library. Because that way, as developers move on to other projects or if they're not available, having these increased security measures, which may be brand new to your company, may not be easily derived down the road, particularly is if the person with knowledge, moves on to a different area of the bank. They're not available in the project, or they move on to a, another opportunity. So you want to make sure that you have all that knowledge, and you can respond with future applications or enhance existing applications and bring them up to standards. So usage decreases using this will decrease your development timelines, and admins should test special attention applications as well. Now, the admins working together again, with development administrators, the admin should refuse to deploy an app if it fails to meet the basic requirements. So once you've established that you need to have either on your customer-facing or um, special area, special interest areas of your firm that they have to have increased application enhancements, don't deploy them unless they exist. And you need to know, as an administrator, what's on your network. So if you have an application that requires special encryption, 
or increased ACL capabilities that you know what's out there and you can then state emphatically to your auditors and legal that, yeah, you're doing that, it's out there, you've tested it, and you've verified it. And it's important, again, that all of your requirements and everything you do works well with legal and audit. So areas of concern, more than many realize, you have the, the domino directory, who keeps creating rep safe conflicts? I've gone to companies where they'll have thousands of rep safe conflicts in the domino directory, sometimes hundreds just for servers. It's, it's mind boggling, but they don't know where they're coming from. And I've gone in and I've created views to help work with that. But that doesn't, even in and of itself, not a lot of companies know how to do that. So you want to know that that is an area of concern and determining the right level of control. Which administrators should really be editing documents and which documents should they be editing? Too many people just have a, too many companies just have a general area of, or general administrations group and people from different companies just go in and have full access as an administrator. You want to make sure you ratchet that down properly. And those I and I, who's tracking edited, state timestamps. When was the file edited? You can go to the OS level and see when the last time it was edited, but what did they do? Mission critical high visibility applications, finding corporate data being printed against policy. You want to make sure that if you have applications where you that should be thwarted that you have you remove the capability. More advanced agent log statistics, longer ACL change. Domino gives you 20 entries in the ACL as a history, but you may have a requirement to have a longer tracking option. You may also want to know specifically what was changed. Domino will tell you, you know, Bill Malchuski changed administration groups, but it doesn't tell you what they changed. And so you may need that level of, of protection or coverage. In, intrusion detection, so internally accessing attempts to off-limit areas. If somebody's trying to get to a database or a server, Domino will record that. But specific, getting into repeated attacks even for servers, if Domino's not running, you want to make sure that that is, that is there. Or if it stores just backup data with Domino information on there, that you, you can grab that you can grab that option and, and protect yourself. User activity beyond the notes user activity. You can enable user, de user tracking and user activity in your database, but that's just very simplistic, telling you reads and writes you're probably going to, you may, not probably, you may want to know what documents were they reading. And so there's third-party options or using the API can help give you that. So logging the concerns. Once, you've, uh, once you have this information, you need to make sure that it's captured somewhere. So you need to locate warning signs easily. It's hardly adequate just to capture the information. Recall the unmarked backup tapes example I provided earlier. Capturing the data but having no plan to do anything with it isn't really very good. So Powerful capture, capture System will let you find what you need. It will capture the data in the areas of concern. And now you can have some, with statistics, and some, you can have some very serious data mining capa capabilities. So eye-opening situations are generally revealed when a deeper cut of one's environment occurs. The answers are usually there, but rarely no one takes the time to look, not because they don't want to, they just don't have the time, or they don't know that they should be looking there. So this can help as well to ensure that you uncover situations before they're a problem. OK, so in the final section, I have here just a couple resources for you for, for, for further review. IT responses to Sarbanes-Oxley. We have the IT governance area as well that uh, IBM Lotus, Lotus Software has a document on. And remembering, as we mentioned earlier, IM blogs are the next target for litigation. So courts aren't just looking at email and calendars anymore. They're actually looking at all mobile data. So there is my contact information. We have uh, I'm Bill, Bill at BillMal.com for email. My blog is BillMal.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and on AIM, Skype, Yahoo. I am always available. So please, if you have any questions or issues, I'm happy to assist at any time. So I'll give it back to Chris, I believe. Excellent. No, that's excellent. Let me see if there's any questions in there. I was looking in the wrong tab. You guys are good. Actually, I learned a ton of stuff about some things that we need to change on controlling and policing. So let me see. Excellent. I'll be back. Let's see if anybody has any. I don't see any hands raised by everybody that's in there. No hands, no questions, nothing. Wow. Shot. Right. Very thorough, then. <laughs> that, uh, no, I'm actually shocked. Usually there's a few that flow through. If anybody has some, a couple more minutes, we'll flip over here, and then we'll get out of here. Let me take that back. Actually, I'll leave yours up for a second, Bill, so I can get your information. Sure. So we'll leave it up. 
So if anyone has any questions, otherwise, uh, Secure Track, I know you guys are still there and on the phone, Ryan. Absolutely. And Absolutely. We do appreciate the opportunity to be part of this today and great presentation there, Bill. Covered a lot of great uh, merit points there in regards of compliance. And then don't forget, you get to tell them about your offer again, Ryan, that you guys are doing for Secure Track. Yeah, just to reiterate that is uh, we do support all platforms of Domino up to uh, as well as Domino 851, and uh, we are making available a free license of SecureTrack to all attendees today. Simply drop us a quick email, and uh, we can get you squared up with that as well. So we do appreciate the time today. Excellent. Uh, that's Sorry. a great opportunity. That's actually, yeah, a free, a free code for uh, the rest of the year is an awesome opportunity for everybody that's in there. So definitely drop a note, send a message. Uh, you've got Ryan's information, you have Bill's, you have, of course, ours for the webcast itself, and I can get it over if you don't have theirs. And otherwise, we will close it up, guys, and call it a day. Good? Awesome. All right, gentlemen, thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for attending. If you have more questions, let me know. Please send me a note, send me a message and let me know that you actually have those. Uh, otherwise, we are done for the day, and that's another consultant in your pocket webcast right there.